Hi everybody. Um, I'm Uzma. Uh, I'm a G I'm a GP in Barking and Dagenham, and I am also a GP trainer. So this is my interest in, um, in you know, training. So I love talking about different topics. So today we're going to talk about COPD, and this is a level three session. So this is uh, we're going to do it. It's going to be a bit more higher level with more uh, sort of three letter abbreviations and jargon used today. Um, it might feel if you're a new learner or if you're a non non clinical staff, it might feel a bit um, that we've jumped a bit too much. You might feel a bit lost. Uh, it's absolutely fine. Just 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 ask us any questions you have any anything you'd like to repeat us to repeat or explain any further we're happy to do that i'm going to do a little uh, recap in the beginning of the other sessions that we did because they were more clinical we spoke more about personalized care in the first one then in the second one we spoke more about the medical management inhalers inhaler techniques um, this one I'm going to do a quick recap and then I want to hand over to Chi who's a personalized uh, healthcare coach and she will talk about role of personalization with COPD especially with complex cases and then we've got um, we have our guest speakers today um, we've got Jadine and she is a specialist respiratory nurse and she's based in Porters Avenue in Nauft um, and she sees the complex uh, COPD patients. Um, she's going to talk to us about pulmonary rehab and the oxygen therapy service. And um, so I think I'm really looking forward to this session. And um, I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen. So uh, if at the end we have time, we will cover some cases. But I think um, I think we've got a lot to get through in this one session. So. Um, Made you make a start. I think it's just a bit slow. Okay, so the aim and outcome today, we're going to talk about what is COPD, whether we're going to go for goals. Uh, we're going to do a short summary about the management, what is QAF. Um, what it entails, and we're we'll talking about personalization roles, um, family rehab, and oxygen therapy. I'm just come off video because I've got low bandwidth. Um, so COPD, as you know, is chronic obstructive airway disease, and GOLD stands for Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease. Now that's the question, are we going for GOLD or are we going for NICE? Um, majority of people are going for gold. It's actually quite simple. Um, in our in BHR, so Barking, Havering, and Redbridge, on our internet, we've got a guideline which is um, amalgamated. So it's nice and gold. And um, our medicine management team has kindly made a guideline for us. If you wanted to consult that, please feel free. Um, so the main big changes that have happened in the management recently um, are about who are we going to give the inhaled corticosteroids to, uh, who's likely to benefit the most from it. Because having um, uh, inhaled corticosteroids increases the risk of pneumonia. There, when the eosinophils are less than 0.1, um, haemophilus is likely colonizes these patients. So giving them inhaled corticosteroids might, you know, erupt pneumonia. So, I mean, I, I haven't actually seen this that much, but we've got JD here with us who might be able to uh, shed more light. I think I give everybody <laughs> inhaled corticosteroids, everybody I know in my COPD, they're, they're, they're on um, ICS, but now I'm closely looking at eosinophils. Um, so the way we identify is we look at their eosinophil levels. So do we, um, the ones that have 0.3 or more are very likely to benefit because eosinophils go up if there's inflammation, if there's an allergy. So uh, typically asthmatics and people with allergies will have a high. Uh, so those are the people that inhaled corticosteroids would really likely to benefit. It's least likely to benefit if they if the eosinophils are less than 0.1. There's not a lot of inflammation going on. Um, uh, in their lungs. But as a clinician, I think I have seen that um, people, uh, frail people, elderly patients with this condition, they're not likely to mount an inflammatory response. So um, sometimes you, you can give them, it's not always visible as eosinophil. So I've noticed that they always seem to benefit with steroid inhalers. So um, 
it's it's but for the guidelines this is what they're what they're saying um so the prophylactic antibiotic they've made a change so they said we can use ditromycin three days a week and when they have an acute exacerbation the antibiotics and steroids are for five days we don't we're moving away from seven days we want five days and we use prednisolone if they're breathless so you can use the antibiotics on their own so you don't always have to use the steroids, especially if they're not breathless. And you use antibiotics if there's a sputum change. So I thought, um, I'm not going to dwell too long on the management because we can talk for over an hour on this. Um, so I thought I'll do a brief summary. There's this, I love this picture, this diagram, because it speaks a thousand words. So the main thing is they have to give up smoking. Um, COPD is very highly linked to, to smoking. Very, it's like very rare to have COPD if they're not smoking. Um, mostly they might have an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency or, or, you know, so it's better to investigate them for other things. Uh, Pulmonary rehab is key, is a goal. It's like, it's really need to do that. So that's why we're doing a webinar today to increase our awareness about it um, and uh, so you can give them um, a, a short acting beta agonist which is a ventolin inhaler um, and then you know uh, you can progress them to the LABA, LAMA, ICS um, according to the goals, uh, goals you know uh, the different the goals uh, guidelines um, and in specific uh, groups you're going to do pulmonary rehab and long-term azithromycin and can be used and for people. So um, we always start with the short-acting beta agonist. I mean, you can use Atrovent, which is your short-acting muscarinic antagonist. But remember, the next step is to add a lava and a lama, or just a lava or just a lama on its own. So if you've already given them Atrovent, which is the short-acting um, muscarinic antagonist, then you're not going to use a lama with it. So um, I'm not sure there's a washout period, but um, so most people don't give atrovent these days. Everybody gets given the Ventolin. Then the next stage, they go on to the Lava Lama. Um, and, and then you add an ICS, uh, especially if they're having more than two, uh, you know, chest infections or, or had one hospital admission in the year, you're going to do an ICS. Um, and especially if the eosinophils are over 0.3. And stopping smoking is the most important, um, most important intervention that they can actually can actually have. So, and long-term therapy, oxygen therapy actually helps to reduce mortality. So that's why we have Jadine today here to talk to us about that. I thought I'll put down a little chart about the type of the antibiotics. So the NICE guideline um, tells us there's three antibiotics they recommend, amoxicillin or doxycycline or pretromycin. So our local guidelines are based on that as well. So, um, you know, in high risk, you can use colmoxiclav, levofloxacin. But levofloxacin, I would definitely talk to a microbiologist before I give it to them. Specialists tend to use it without talking to micros, but um, I think I would say that um, try them with amoxicillin cycling um, and clavitromycin. So when we're choosing um, inhalers, it's recently the market has just exploded because uh, I trained in medicine 20 years ago and we only had salbutamol, we only had, you know, uh, serotide and, you know, just the normal, I call them the normal inhalers. But now we've got all these things called uh, Ultibro Ulti and Anoro and, you know, Relvar and Trilogy, Trimbo. I'm like, so I find the, this, um, these charts very helpful for me. So first I start them off with the Saba. Um, I haven't really given them Atrovent in the community, but I know in hospital we used to give them Atrovent. But now um, the next step up will be we'll give them a Lava Lama com combination. So uh, on this chart, it's very easy. So it just tells you the name. So there's the recipe match, you've got the Ultibro and the Anoro. And then if you want to go for triple therapy, so, you know, if those patients who are having frequent chest exacerbations or have had a hospital admission um, or the resinophils are very high, over 0.33, then you're giving them the Trimbo, you're giving them, you know, Trilogy. So I, I now I know these names, I, I just stick to them. 
Um, and if you choose after your Ventolin inhaler to go up and you don't want to give them a llama, so if you've given them a say, short acting, um, you know, muscarinic antagonist, then you can do the ICS and the LABA one. So RELVA is a very common, Elipta is a very common one that we use. So um, these are all the, um, there. So at ICS, we reserve it especially for people with asthma type steroid responsiveness. So we, in general practice, we have uh, this thing called quality outcomes framework. I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, so this year, there's very few points. So they've reduced it and it's slowly being reduced. So we had these points. So we got eight points if you could just maintain a register. And um, you have to do a spirometry uh, within three months of the di before diagnosing, within the three months or six months after diagnosing, you can do that. And their FEV1, FEC ratio should be less than 0.7. Um, so um, the other point one is about the ongoing management of COVD patients. So you want it to have a review of them at least uh, every 12 months um, and you have to document a medical uh, research council the MRC dyspnea score and if the MRC dyspnea score is over th is three or more then you have to re re you have to refer them or offer them a pulmonary rehab program now it's always every 12 months so and there is a lot of evidence there actually uh, actually really really helps so at the review, the fact the once a year review, um, it's very complex. So um, uh, I would recommend using the e uh, template because you literally, if you fill out all the fields in the template, then you've done the review properly. There has to be a personalized action plan and this it needs to be produced in line with the national guidelines. Now, EMIS helps you with that or from the uh, PAP, a COPD um, website that there is um, if you just google it you know it comes up and you just personalize it with put their name down put what inhalers they're on what's their you know um, when should they call a 111 when should they call their GP when do they start using their um, you know rescue pack and what is their rescue pack and it's got all this information it's got a number for a national respiratory nurse as well so they can just ring this line whenever if they want some advice or they want to learn more about it so we do a cat score which is a copd assessment test it's really complicated to remember there is an online calculator so um i normally text it to the patient through accurate to uh, to fill it out before they come and see us um so that then we've got the the higher the score uh the worse I think the worst the, the COPD is. So, um, and we just have, it's, all this has to be documented. You should offer them a vaccination, pneumococcal, their flu jab. You look at their frailty score, their depression, anxiety, what's their BMI. Because, you know, when it gets severe, they start to lose a lot of weight. So um, helping them with the dietitian, supporting them. You know, some of them, the anxiety might be really high. So this is where your personalized care roles and mental health practitioners will come um, handy. Um, so you also review the inhaler technique. Um, so when do you refer to secondary care? This is when you're not sure, is this COPD, is this asthma, is this not COPD, especially if they're young. So if they're under 40 and they're displaying signs of COPD or the spirometry says they have COPD, then you know, you need to consider other diagnoses. If there's other signs, like if there's blood in the sputum, there's very frequent infections, you know, you're considering other diagnoses. This is where I think I will need the respiratory team. So I will be referring them into secondary care. And if the FEV1 rapidly declines, now, how would we know that? Because we, we're not doing that anymore. This quaff doesn't ask us to do it. So we're not doing it in the pandemic. We've also stopped doing it. So, but if you, for whatever reason, see or realize that everyone has just been a loss of more than 500 mils in a, in you know less than five years or, or the severe symptoms and I would say just refer and you also refer if they might need surgery probably rehab oxygen you know and the and the criteria for oxygen therapy J Dean is going to take us um further uh, into that um so yes yeah, so at this point I will stop uh sharing and I will hand over to G um and thank you for being, uh, oh yes, and chest x-ray. Thank you, Kim, for reminding me that chest x-ray, especially when you first diagnose them, at least have a, have a chest x-ray. Um, I will now, so uh, whilst, um, whilst we're putting up G's, um, G slides, I'm just gonna. 
Yes, there is a bit of background noise. Sorry, I'm at the RCGP conference. Sorry, just for clarity, is it? It's G, right? G next, please. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Isma. Thank you. Okay, so um, I am just going to share how the personalised care roles can uh, support patients and uh, healthcare professionals in um, the management of complex COPD. Um, as you know, I'm a senior health and wellbeing coach, been in this role for coming up to four years now, and I'm also support, supporting the educators as um, from BHRC PIN. Um, next slide, please. So um, the personalised care MDT usually takes place on a weekly basis and really offers a platform for uh, social prescribers, health and wellbeing coaches and the um, uh, integrated workforce to discuss complex cases who present with multiple long term conditions. And really, social prescribing provides that, I suppose, formal channel for GPs and healthcare professionals um, to refer and connect patients uh, to a range of non-clinical services within the local communities, but more so within the personalised care team. And this is where we will um, explore uh, other areas of uh, a patient's well-being, such as their emotional and mental health. Um, and we'll look at financial, housing, debt management, support to stop, stop, stop smoking, weight and nutritional advice, and so on and so forth. And I've put a couple of links there which you might be interested in. Next slide, please. So really, it's more of a collective uh, support package that we can offer patients to help them manage their holistic well-being or well-being holistically. Um, as I've just said, social prescribers connect people to activities, groups and services in the community. Um, health and wellbeing coaches like myself, it's about setting their wellbeing goals and being very realistic about what they want to achieve across what timeline. So it's all about supported self-management. Um, and we really home into the behaviour change um, element so changing mindsets and behavior and this is really really powerful when it comes to changing habits um, such as stop smoking um, and care coordinators will really look at navigating uh, or helping patients navigate their care plan and and designing care plans so um, it's about helping them live well with the conditions that they're presenting with how can we improve their quality of life and really ask them what matters to them right now? What is the most important thing that matters to them that can create a more independent and joyful life? Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just what some patients have fed back. So we've seen um, a lot of patients over the years in, in my own practice, over 1500 patients. And one common theme is that they find it's an excellent service, um, meaning they've been able to discuss, have time to discuss other things that have mattered to them whilst their medical condition is being taken care of. So it's a, a very uh, useful and uh, helpful service to um, for patients to access. Next slide, please. OK, so as a health coach, I just wanted to paint a picture of what a common um, referral looks like when it reaches um, the JOY platform, which is the platform we use to receive referrals from GPs and clinicians. Um, and so it comes through the social prescribing channel in, onto the JOY platform where we will triage patients. And often GPs will refer patients for stress management, that they require motivation or they need healthy eating support or lifestyle improvements. But these are the common um, kind of uh, referral tags, if you'd like to call them, that we will receive. And generally, I will have about 60 minutes with a patient and offer them six sessions that they can do what they like in it. Sometimes they come in, they just sit and they just want to chat. And that's OK if it means that they go away feeling lighter and um, uh, 
able to manage their lifestyle better. Next slide, please. So I check in the patient and find out where they're actually operating from today. So, um, you know, what, what stresses and concerns do they have today that they want to uh, talk about and identify really what matters to them the most at this moment. And we'll shape some goals around that. Often I might just um, go online and use the Be Mindful app, which is 10 questions just to ascertain where they're sitting with the, the, the stress that they're um, feeling right now. If, Yasmin, if you just press the slide again, and then we look at their ability to bounce back. Where is their resilience? So are they feeling um, really heavy and burdened by the, the stress that they're having to deal with? It could be breathing, but it could be finances. It could be housing. It could be a certain situation that they're dealing with right now. That's really um, uh, exacerbating uh, their breathing. So we'll have we'll spend five or 10 minutes shaping this. Next slide, please. And then often I will um, look at uh, homing into some um, exercise. So it's a, a practicum just to bring them into the room by focusing on their breath. And here are a couple of breathing techniques that I use. It's the box breathing. If I invite you all just to inhale for four and then pause for four and slowly exhale for the count of four and pause for a count of four and whilst i'm talking through this presentation if you could continue to do that so just following the box breathing technique. And this is a really, really quick and gentle way to help an individual focus. It reduces the panic producing situation. It kind of like diverts the mindset and helps to control that erratic breathing um, uh, kind of response that they've come in with and creates a really calm state of mind in a short space of time. It helps to breathe rhythmically. So that's a very simple technique that I will use whilst I'm um, speaking or, or, or listening to a patient. It creates a shift in mindset. We know that there's a really strong, powerful breath, mind connection. And within that breathing, it helps them create change. So they see the situation in a completely different light. I've just shared here, according to the COPD Foundation, there are several uh, effective breathing techniques. There's the pursed lip breathing and the diaphragmatic abdominal breathing. And both of these exercises require a bit of practice, but it does improve relaxation and concentration and help an individual engage in the present moment. So it really alleviates the anxiety and the stress that they may be feeling. The pursed lip Breathing is like literally you sealing your lips and rolling the tongue and you're breathing in through the mouth. So you're breathing the ear in through the mouth and drawing it in. And I will adapt it along with the four by four box breathing technique. Again, very powerful. Also very effective at cooling the body if we're having hot flushes. Next slide, please. Another technique I might use is just a simple body scan, which I don't have time to practice now, but I've put a link here for the autogenic relaxation or it's called progressive relaxation technique. And this link um, is actually uh, directly with, I think, Newcastle NHS Trust, who have, have put this YouTube video together, which is very effective. Uh, you might like to try it. And what we really do with our patients is that we, um, we, talk to them about 
we stress and anxiety is such a situation that we may not be able to control everything that happens to us. We may not be able to control the stressor or the situation at that time, but what we can control is our response to it. So it's empowering that behavior change or empowering them with skills and techniques to control their response to whatever they're having to deal with. So it's encouraging that can do, I am still in control kind of mindset. Next slide, please. And then it's committing to a purposeful action. So we understand why they've come or the, why they've been referred to see a health coach. And then we will look at what are they going to do differently after the, the first coaching session and how and also when they, they're going to agree to prioritize the self-care management regardless of what's going on uh, around them. And also ascertain that if we keep doing what we've always done, we're not going to make any difference. And it's also important, one, one thing that's very important is to start where you are, to use what we can, uh, what we've got to do what we can. So it's really simple baby steps um, to ensure that we're just dealing with what the most important issue is right now. Next slide, please. So the benefits of health and wellbeing coaching dedicated to COPD, um, we encourage a mindset shift. So it's really a growth mindset. It's a positive mindset rather than focusing on the problem. And it could just be the breathing, but rather than just focusing on that, I can't, we put them in a state of, I can look at what I can do. It's also to improve the awareness of their condition, but generally most patients are experts in their condition. They already know what works for them and what doesn't work for them. We're really teasing out some um, uh, extra tools that can support them. Uh, we help them improve their education and managing a kind of like living well with their their lung conditions. And also it helps to reduce that burden on um, the clinical staff. So we can probably uh, take more time to help them deal with their condition. Um, we can also support them with facilitating a self-management care plan. Um, it improves patient self-satisfaction, for example, improves their sleep and helps them with their lifestyle changes. Um, and many other things. And I've put lots of links there for you to explore in your own time. Next slide, please. Yes, Mina, next slide, please. I've put it on the next slide. Can you not see it? Oh, no, it's not. Sorry, there it is. Um, so uh, this is a randomized controlled trial for uh, about health coaches. Uh, that were involved with COPD, which I found very interesting. And patients reported better quality of care after health coaching. They were less likely to report symptoms of moderate or severe depression, so a real mindset shift. And 48% fewer hospitalizations related to COPD after seeing a health coach, which I thought was very empowering. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I can't see that. I'm not sure why it's frozen. Um, you, you have so, some resources uh, yes so just resources so I've just put some links to some resources um, where you know, for stress management and uh, how yoga can really uh, support in the management of chronic uh, COBD next slide please and also just a reminder that we do look at the NICE guidelines uh, to see what lifestyle management or self-management plans are available to us and really home in on, on that to support patients. Next slide, please. Stop smoking is a big one. So we will always do what we can as health coaches to support patients in improving motivation and activation levels and uh, guiding them to quit smoking. Uh, next slide, please. And some further resources in Living World with COPD. I hope that's been useful and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jadine, should I uh, move on to your slides? If that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to give um, this talk on this service today. 
Um, I'm Jadine. I'm one of the respiratory nurses in the community that does the community COPD asthma um, clinic in Barking and Dagenham. Um, and just to say on the team, we do have um, a respiratory consultant who does a clinic here for us once a week. And he also does the long MDT where we just discuss and review those more complex COPD um, patients. We do also have the physiotherapist who does the pulmonary rehab classes. And we also have a, um, a psychologist on the team for those um, patients who are struggling to come to terms with their diagnosis or they're a bit anxious. But for the psychologist, that's an internal referral so that when we see them, then we will do the, the referral from our end. So today I'm just going to go through our referral process and then I'll touch on oxygen therapy and then on to pulmonary rehabilitation. Next slide. Okay, so what do we do? So we, um, of course, we're an adult service and we support patients diagnosis, diagnosed with COPD or chronic respiratory conditions such as asthma and so on. We support the patients to be more proactive in management in managing their condition, their lung condition. We assess patients who need home oxygen therapy and we do the review. So if they're um, put on oxygen, even if they're outside the borough, we also go in and um, we will um, reassess and follow up from there. And then we have the pulmonary rehabilitation program and then home visits if necessary. So those who can't make it to clinic, we do go in to see them at home. Next slide. Okay, so um, just a few things. I think Dr. Hack went through the whole process, I think for um, referring to the community, but just to touch on a few things. So if you're referring for COPD, we would prefer those patients who are having frequent exacerbations. So maybe two or three in a 12 month um, period. Those with frequent hospital admissions, even if it's just a &E visit, and those at the severe end stage of their um, disease and they're already on maximal therapy. And we ask that if they're quite new, it's a new diagnosis, new patient, um, not sure of the diagnosis, then try and use the hub at the Barking Hospital for spirometry. So they will take the new referrals. When we do see them in clinic, we will do um, yearly spiral when they come in, if appropriate. And then if they could be asked to have a chest X-ray, an up-to-date chest X-ray within the last three months, we say. So even though we are thinking COPD, what else is going on? So that's why we ask for a up-to-date chest X-ray one within the last three months. So you can still do the referral, but just um, you can send them away to have the X-ray done before the appointment. Next slide. If you're referring for asthma, we ask that um, you get the patients to do maybe a peak flow chart minimum of two weeks just to help us when they come to, to see us and also an up-to-date chest X-ray. So the referral for asthma, it's those with uncontrolled symptoms despite optimal um, management. Next slide. Okay, so the criteria for rehab. Okay, so they must have a diagnosis of um, a chronic lung disease. So not for heart failure, not for just pure undiagnosed breathlessness, but a diagnosis of a chronic lung um, condition. Functional disabled by breathlessness. So we're looking at MRC score of two or more. Um, they must be motivated to exercise. What does that mean? So they're, they must be able to get to the venue and they have to commit to the program for at least six weeks, twice a week, six weeks. So they need, um, whether that be by public transport or they're driving, things like that. And um, another criteria is um, exercise tolerance is limited by breathlessness. If it's not for rehab, the physiotherapist will see the patients to help with sputum clearance, 
breathlessness management. So those patients, maybe bronchiectasis patients who have difficulty clearing, um, she will do one-on-one -on -one sputum clearance, breathlessness management, dysfunctional breathing, and sometimes we can arrange um, home exercise, devise a home exercise program for those who cannot do the full six weeks of pulmonary rehab. Um, next slide. Okay, for referring in for oxygen um, assessment, um, for assessment, those um, that you find that there's SpO2 is less than 92% at rest and well. Okay, they they drop their SATs when they exercise, um, and we'll review those who are discharged from ox on oxygen therapy, or they've just recently moved in the area on oxygen. And just to add at the bottom, for those people who are thinking of flying on your ward because their oxygen levels may be on the borderline, we do do the hypoxic challenge that helps us say if they will need oxygen for their flight, so you can refer to us and we do a nebulizer assessment service as well. Next slide. Okay, so those definitely need um, straight to secondary care. So if they have a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, um, TB, suspected lung cancer, chronic cough, so the cough is ongoing for more than three months, um, plural effusions, lung nodules, pulmonary hypertension, and for sleep apnea. There's a sleep clinic, a sleep apnea clinic at um, King George Hospital. So Hello. Yeah, I can't hear JD. Ah, okay, it's her side. I was a bit worried that it might be my side. Is that better? Oh, hello, Holly. you're back. You hello. froze there. Oh my word. Yeah, no worries. Um, <laughs> do I need to go back one slide? No, 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 we're still on this slide. Okay. Thank you. So these are a group of patients that need direct referral to secondary care. However, if they're needing oxygen um, assessment, then of course we will we will see and and um, take it from there. Next slide. Okay. All right. I'm going to go in a bit more into oxygen therapy. Okay. Next one. Okay. So, what are the indications for long-term oxygen therapy? When they come in, we do an assessment. So we're looking at their blood gases and we're looking for a PO2 of less than 7.3. And if their PO2 is less than eight, we're looking to see if they have um, peripheral edema or any secondary um, polycythemia. Okay. Um, when we say 15 hours a day, we expect um, patients to use, they can use it 15 plus hours, but not less to get the benefit of um, the oxygen therapy because it's there to just reduce the workload of the heart. So that's the reason for um, prescribing. If we're going to prescribe oxygen, of course, most of the patients on oxygen are COPD and there are risks that comes with that. So we're looking at their PCO2 levels as well. And especially in patients with um, neuromuscular or chest wall disease, that's a big um, issue. So they might need direct referral for NIV um, therapy, meaning BiPAP plus or without oxygen therapy. Um, next slide. Um, for ambulatory oxygen therapy, um, they need to be referred to us. So we can do the, the walk to see to what extent they desaturate. And then we would walk them with oxygen to see if there's any improvement with the oxygen. It helps us to just determine what flow rate is required. And um, if they're on, ready on long-term oxygen therapy, but they're mobile outdoors, then of course they will also receive ambulatory oxygen. 
And on the picture here, I have the three different types that we have. We have the, the cylinders, even though we say they are small, they are quite heavy. They're about seven pounds. And if we're thinking of our frail patients, they're not able to walk and carry these cylinders. So that's a consideration. Um, the middle one that looks like a barrel, that's liquid oxygen. So again, if we're thinking of giving that as um, their oxygen therapy, they will need to have storage for the, the barrel and then they fill the canisters themselves to take out. And they, the other one there is, um, it's a battery operated. We call that a portable oxygen concentrator so the patients can charge those up themselves and just take out and about as they go. But they're quite heavy. The lightest size we have is about 2.2 kilograms. So sometimes we have to advise the patients if they put them like in a, a backpack or one of their trolley bags that they push or pull with them, making it easier for them. But um, yeah, that's it. Okay, next slide. Okay, so short burst oxygen therapies, it's only for those cluster headache patients. Um, we don't give because of breathlessness anymore, but um, so for these groups of patients, they will need their oxygen therapy, 12 to 15 liters via a non-rebreathe mask, maybe for 15 to 20 minutes, and that should help their headache. We should take it back if it's of no benefit, but most times it, it does help, so they will have it. And this delivery is by the the biggest cylinders, so not a concentrator because they need high flow to help the relief of the oxygen. So we, we can see these patients, but they must have the diagnosis from the neurologist saying, of course, it's um, cluster headache. And we have to give consideration for those people who do smoke, because of course they may have COPD. So we, we go through the whole thing. We do the assessment, we might do a spirometry, we do the blood gases before even starting um, any, any oxygen. Next. Next slide. Can you hear me okay, everybody? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So we, we don't yes. routinely give oxygen um, for um, palliative patients, only if indicated and their oxygen level, their SATs are less than 92%. Okay. So we don't routinely give it for breathlessness. Um, you can still refer to us. We'll go out, we'll do the assessment, we'll do the talk but um, it's not routinely um, prescribed. Um, so we advertise all these um, fan therapy, um, that sort of thing. And remember that oxygen, it's very drying for the nasal passages. So some people get nose blades and if they're already on medication that giving this drying effect, then it's not helping, it's just, in the way, so other things to consider. Next slide. Okay, so what are some of the complications? So I've already mentioned the main one, which is um, CO2 retention, leading to respiratory acidosis, sometimes death. Um, so we have to be very careful when we're giving it to our COPD um, patients. So that's one of the reasons we do the blood gases to help us determine how much, if it's benefiting them, if they need a referral on for BiPAP and IV, then we'll do that. So some early warning signs that we get, maybe morning headaches, drowsiness, any altered mood or any irritability or lack of concentration. Okay. Um, I'll just mention for the sore nose, um, we sometimes ask that they get some water-based cream that they can use for the, the nose to help with that. And the dry mouth, the um, oral, what do you call it now? The artificial saline, if that is a problem. But for oxygen here in Barking and Dagenham with the company that we use, Air Liquide, they don't have humidified oxygen. So it's dry oxygen so sometimes this can be an issue 
for the pressure sores around the ears, we do have some um, cushions that we can give um, to help relieve, relieve those pressures. Okay, next slide. Okay. So we know oxygen is a fire risk. So even though we prescribe here in the clinic, we do make home visit just to make sure that it's safe for them to have. There's no um, red flags, so open fireplace sort of thing, smokers in the house, any hoarding. So we do do home checks as well. The fire services also go in and they will check to make sure that the smoke alarms are working and that they're of good standard and that they're in the right place where the oxygen is in the, in the home. Okay, so if we go in and there's any um, red flags, we have the ability to withdraw the oxygen, of course, to prevent any fire hazard risk. Okay, make sure it's safe. Any questions in regards to oxygen? No, okay. All right, so I'm just going to go on to pulmonary um, rehabilitation. And this can be defined as a interdisciplinary program of care for patients with um, chronic respiratory impairment. This is individually tailored and designed to optimize each patient's physical and social performance and autonomy. It's programs compromise of individual individualized exercise program and education. So it's a it's a two hour or one and a half um, session. So most of it, an hour of it is pure exercise. And then the next bit, it's education around the, the lung condition. So let's move on. It's for COPD patients. So it's confirmed respiratory diagnosis. So COPD, interstitial lung, sarcoid, bronchiectasis, asthma, people who are going on to have lung surgery, so they, the consultants usually ask for um for the for them to complete pulmonary rehabilitation program before surgery and after after surgery. Okay, so it's for those patients with a confirmed respiratory diagnosis and an MRC score of more than two or more. Okay, so the classes are twelve sessions in total over six weeks. So they're run twice per week. For us, we do Monday and the Thursday. And there's two classes run, running. So the first class say, for example, we'll start at half 10, they will exercise. Then the other class will come in and they'll do a combined um, session of education. And then that first group will leave and then the second group will just carry on with the, with the exercise. So the exercise compromise cardiovascular and resistance training. So that's why we say the patients must be able to do these because it's not, even though it's chair-based, they're working really hard, okay, during the, the sessions, okay? And then the second component is um, education. So the education is usually around diet, how to manage their exacerbation, um, general information around their lung condition. There's a psychology who would go in sometime to give their input. We have the, um, myself would go in and talk about oxygen therapy. So it's a whole range. It depends on the group at the time and um, what they, what they, what they want. But different special speciality will go in to give give the talk breathing techniques postural drainage that sort of thing is done um during the education aspect of pulmonary rehabilitation okay next slide so for exclusion for pulmonary classes is um those with unstable angina uncontrolled hypertension cardiac arrhythmias recent MI um, and so on. If we know that there's um, 
uh, AAA that is greater than five. It's not easy to always tell, but that's one of the exclusion. Cognitive impairment. So they have to be able to work through, follow the um, the exercise. And if that's an issue, then it's not going to work for them. If there is severely impaired balance or episodes of syncope, pulmonary rehab is not. They may need one-to-one. -one, so it doesn't say you can't ref walk, but it's one of the things. Okay, next slide. Sorry, um, I just wanted to let you know, JD, there there's some questions in the chat. Uh, one okay. from Rita Ogana. What's the criteria for referring asthmatic patients for pulmonary rehab, please? Um, you can refer. If they are breathless and their breathlessness score is two or more, that's fine. Um, if we're seeing them in clinic and it's appropriate, then we'll automatically just refer for PR. But if um, their breathlessness score, we don't say they can't come, but if their breathless score is two or more, then definitely they're welcome for pulmonary rehab. Okay. And then you have another question by Maria Ribeiro, who asks, how can you refer to your services? Is there a form? Yes. And I will come to that at the end. Okay. All right. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so for pulmonary rehab, the classes are held at the Eastbrook Community Hall. Um, they start at 10.30. And then I was talking about the sandwich class. So the teaching will start at 11.30. And then the next session together will be at 12. Um, and then they're, they're adding an additional class, which will start at 2 p.m. And that, I believe, is on a Thursday. And they're all rolling programs. So if somebody has um, dropped out, then they'll get somebody else to fill that um, that space. So the waiting list for pulmonary rehab, it's not very long at the moment because they're getting through. It's about four weeks. So that's fine. Um, and at, the, at the, the hall, there's ample parking and there are two bus routes. That's where um, they there's just another question, uh, mm -hmm. Jadine, uh, on the chat by MB. Uh, can we refer for chest X-ray and uh, pulmonary rehab at the same time, or do we have to wait for X-ray report first? No, you don't have to wait for X-ray um, report as long as they have the, the form to go and do the X-ray before their appointment. And for pulmonary rehab, it's four weeks. So if they can have the X-ray done within that time, and to see the nurses, it's not very long. It could be two weeks. So definitely they need to be told to have the x-ray done as soon as possible. We won't send it back if we know that they have been asked to have a chest x-ray because we can look to see if it's done. So when we're doing the triage, we'll look to see if it's done and then we will book them in. Okay. Um, and there's another one from uh, Rita Ogana. She says, do you accept referrals from Havering? Not Havering, because Havering have their own respiratory service, so just refer directly to them. If they're in Havering, but the PR classes are closer to where they live, then we sort of have a understanding with the Havering team that they will come to us. If same Similarly, if we have somebody embarking and dagging them and they're closer to Havering, where they're having the PR classes, then they will go to the PR classes in in Havering. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please everyone do continue asking your questions. I know we're um, only about five minutes away, but um, if you want to ask your questions, please do so um, on the chat. Thank you. Next slide, there's another one. Okay, so the objective for pulmonary rehabilitation is to reduce, reduce dyspnea, um, meaningful improvements in the health related questionnaires. Ooh, can you go back? <laughs> okay. Improve mastery over their long-term condition, functional exercises increase um, and improve health status. So hopefully they'll be able to, if they do get an exacerbation, they're able to recover a bit better after doing the classes. Next slide. And this was as 
results in reduced total number of hospital days, reduced total number of admissions post rehab than the year prior to rehab. Next slide. Okay, and we these are the outcome measures that we use. So these are done before and after pulmonary rehabilitation. So the assessment is they're using the um, incremental shuttle walk test, or it could be a six, six minute walk test. They also fill in the COPD cut um, form. There's the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7 that they also fill in, and then feedback from their um, their um, questionnaire, their, their patient expectation satisfaction questionnaire. That's done um, before and after the, the, the classes as well. So that's how they measure um, if the classes have been of any benefit. Um, to the next slide. Okay, there is a form for referring um, to the service um, and you should have, the, I don't have them, but if you let me know who needs it, then I could um, email directly to yourselves. Yeah, it's a really easy form to fill and um, I've got really good experience with them. They deliver within an hour. They get the oxygen wherever you want. And this is how I get those palliative care oxygen in the community when they don't fulfill the criteria with the respiratory team. Um, you can still get it for your patients, but you just have to take a lot of risk. You have to, on the form, you have to literally sign your life away that no one smokes near them. No one has a cigarette and all this, but it's a really really good service um, yeah so if you just go onto the air liquid um, website and if you haven't registered just register and just complete the hoof a if there's somebody already have oxygen and they're on ambulatory oxygen you won't be able to change it on the hoof a so you might have to just let us know and we'll go in and change it on the, the hoof b so hoof B is the ambulatory oxygen um, side of things, but you can prescribe for your cluster headaches, for your um, palliative um, patients. Thank you so much, uh, Jadine. Thank you so much, everybody, uh, for staying on and for asking all your questions. I know that Maria uh, Ribeiro is asking for the form, uh, Jadine. So oh. uh, if you could send it to me and I can send it to whoever okay. would need it, that would be great. Before everybody leaves, please, I know we're about a minute away. I have uh, the famous feedback form. I think most of you are used to this by now. Five seconds to fill in, multiple choice. You'd only have to write down your name. Please uh, be honest uh, and let us know what you thought. Any feedback would be most welcome. And if you have any more questions, of course. Yeah, thank here. you so much everyone for attending. I've put yeah, it in the chat. You, so. Yes. Sorry, just one one more thing for those who came in a bit yeah. late. I've put it in the chat, uh, the the survey, and you'll get a certificate of attendance uh, when you complete it. And I would need about three to five working days to send that over to you because I'm facilitating webinars every day. I have to create the certificates. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Yasmina, for all your help and support. It's really, really helpful to, to run it smoothly because there's so much information to get through. And, and I'm really grateful to Jadine and G for supporting um, the webinar today. Um, it's, it's amazing. I think together we could all make a difference. I think every consultation we're having in the community, you know, whether it's um, health, you know, any health professional, pharmacists, GPs, um, you know, we've got care coordinators, social prescribers, dietitians, nutritionists, you know, all our big team in Porters Avenue, I've always found them, all my respiratory nurses, I've found them really, really helpful, uh, you know. So I've got a good relationship, I think, <laughs> with our nurses at Porters Avenue. Sometimes I walk around and I might just pop in and just say hello. I think it goes a long way with our relationships and it helps to look after the patients. And I've learned so much, so much, you know from all of the team at Porters Avenue and you'll have the equivalent team in your areas as well. So um, NELF, uh, you know, all the details are on NELF Google. You could Google it and you could ring them up and talk to them. And I think I'm sure you would tend, you would know who your local nurse is um, attached to your team. So um, that, that's really helpful. So uh, 
Yeah, thank you so much, everyone attending. And please just let us know any suggestions, improvements. Yasmina is really good, so she will make sure your points are heard. <laughs> I really do take on your feedback, everybody. It's really important for us. Thank you so much for everyone who's um, been regular attenders to the Long Term Conditions Education Programme. Once again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uzma. I just wanted to say to, to Hecti, I just wanted to say to the Hecti's question that um, in Havering, it's all on the single point access. You know, your spa form, um, it's on there. You just tick the box for respiratory nurses. So over there, it's much simpler. In Barky Dagen, and we've got a form for everything, so it's different <laughs> slightly. Thank you, and thank you again to JD Hamilton. Um, sorry, is it Mackenzie or Hamilton? I put uh, Mackenzie, Mackenzie on on the flyer. That's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you so much for coming uh, and preparing the slides and doing your wonderful presentation, um, Nancy. I will send the survey again. It's just in the chat if you saw it. To everybody else, um, once again, thank you. If you've done this, the survey, you are free to leave. If you haven't, please do the survey. I'll stop recording. There we are.